Mar Pejens, a wonderful traveler that we're going to learn a lot about how to make money online, how to be a great traveler, how to be as, try to be as wonderful as her. Welcome. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Good morning or good evening, wherever you are. You, you just told me that you're not an interesting traveler for this group, but I think you're a really interesting traveler. So yeah, you, you may have started traveling with shopping trips to Andorra, but I think it was a, a, a South Pacific trip that, that was a big switch in your career. So talk about that trip and and how you how you pivoted to a whole new phase of what you're doing yeah sure um i was a, a management consultant in the telco industry and after working non-stop pretty much with not a lot of holidays not a lot of disconnection for six years at that time i decided that i wanted to have a little bit of a break and a career break and take a little bit of a sabbatical so it took me a while to be able to convince everybody and to prepare for it and hand over my projects and you know and be able to take uh, that time off but eventually i managed to get six weeks, uh, mm -hmm. which doesn't seem like a lot. And it went by very fast for a sabbatical. It's not really a massive disconnection. But when you're working 24 seven, 15 hours a day, nonstop, um, suddenly six weeks are like, you know, like uh, a lot of time. So I decided to go to the Pacific. It was kind of a spur of a moment. I met a friend of mine who was also a consultant in another company and who was taking a sabbatical at the same time, well, just before me. And, uh, and he said, oh, you know, I'm going to the Pacific. I'm going to these countries. And I felt like, you know, that sounds interesting, why not? So I decided to do the same. So he was finishing his trip uh, in the Solomon Islands and I was starting my trip in the Solomon Islands. And then I did uh, from Solomon to Vanuatu, Vanuatu to Fiji, from Fiji to Tonga, Tonga to Samoa, Samoa, American Samoa. And then I went back to Asia. Uh, I was already living in Singapore. So I went back to Asia and I spent another week in, in Vietnam. So that those six weeks or, or those five weeks that I spent in the Pacific were like super cool. I loved it, I was on my own. Um, it was also a really long time to travel by myself, the first time that I was traveling for so long on my own. And, you know, if you're a, if you're a solo traveler, you get asked and you get talked to all the time by everybody, right? And at that time in the Pacific, there were even fewer uh, tourists than there are today. In some of these countries mm -hmm. now are a little bit developed, right? Like Vanuatu has a lot of tourism these days, even Solomon, Tonga, Samoa, especially Samoa has a lot of uh, Australian and New, Zealand, uh, New Zealanders um, going there for holidays. Back then, 2012, not that many, right? Except for Fiji. I would say I didn't see tourists anywhere else, even Vanuatu, there were like just a few uh, Australians and, and Kiwis, but that's about it. And Tonga and Samoa, practically none. American Samoa, no tourists whatsoever, right? Solomon Islands, no tourists whatsoever. So it was kind of cool to be there and the locals were curious and whatever other traveler that was there was also curious. So mm -hmm. you're never really alone when you're alone. People always talk to you. Um, so it was like really cool. It was a good time to be by myself. The internet was not what it is today. So, you know, like there were definitely no like uh, social media um, apps that I was spending a lot of time in. I was like occasionally post on Facebook or something like that, but it was, it was a very offline type of experience. Uh, and it was great. I would go to like internet cafes to have internet or try to find some hotspot to have internet because internet was not that common in those countries. They, they didn't even have roaming, many of them. So I was completely disconnected. So it, it was a great personal and traveling experience. And they are countries that I love. I love the Pacific. I continue to love it. I've returned four more times to visit the remaining countries. So I, I really love it there. What, what's a good entry point? Samoa, Vanuatu, somebody they're not some in, insane every country traveler, but they're really interested in the region. Yeah, the South Pacific are the easiest ones. So Fiji is a really developed, Fiji Vanuatu are the most developed countries for tourism. It's really easy to, to be there. Like, like there's lots of solo travelers, there's lots of backpackers, particularly in Fiji. There's a lot of tourism infrastructure. Fijians are very friendly, very welcoming. Mm -hmm. They live up tourism. So they are very used to welcoming foreigners and the infrastructure is just great. And you can get around as cheaply as you like. And also there's beautiful five-star hotels if you want to. So those two are the easiest. They don't feel very different, especially Fiji. It feels similar to parts of Hawaii, for example, that are a little bit less developed. Maybe not Honolulu, but you know, like other parts of Hawaii that might be less touristy um, and it's a very easy place to start the South Pacific and also Fiji is very well connected you have flights from LA you get flights from Auckland from uh, from Brisbane from Sydney you have flights from even Singapore so it's quite well connected mm. and you said even Singapore and, and uh, I once heard you say that that Singapore is actually not the ideal place to base yourself for for going to a lot of different countries and it, it surprised me in that I thought you were perfectly positioned yeah. for, for country collecting. So talk about the pros and cons of Singapore as a as a expat based travel focused. 
Hey, I mean, it's a great place to live in as an expat, right? Life, life is really yeah. easy. And as an expat, what do you want? You want convenience? You want a place that speaks your language? If you're looking for the easy life, right? If you're looking for an easier expat place to live in, Singapore is really safe. It's really developed. It's really efficient, like ridiculously efficient, right? Like it's mm-hmm. almost, you're almost happy to pay your taxes because you're like, oh my God, it's so efficient to pay your taxes, right? <laughs> you go online, you can do it on your phone, you know, like five minutes, yeah. you boom, done, you pay your taxes. It's like, oh my God, so easy, right? Um, mm-hmm. The infrastructure is great. Changi Airport is an amazing airport, right? Changi is a, an airport that is like just amazing. You touch, and I've counted this many times, you touch ground and within, you know, five minutes you're at the gate and within, Five minutes you're in the taxi and within 15 minutes you're at home you know like 30 40 minutes from like touching ground to being at home like that's amazing if i compare to dubai where it can take you an hour and a half to get out of the airport i mean changi is unbelievably efficient so it's great if you travel a lot it's a really efficient airport it's an amazing airport and um, i, I was very honest in how much i dislike singapore's changi airport in a blog post no. people who had never <laughs> written my blog but with singapore ip addresses went after me so hard and so angry any airport that makes you go through security again at the gate i hate i i i I get so annoyed that you're stuck in those holding pens i know the new terminal doesn't have it no but you only go to security once right and i think that this is what makes i'm I'm sitting in the lounge or enjoying myself now i've got to leave earlier to get stuck in a holding pen and Singapore, the experience is efficient and okay, but all the airports that copied Singapore and put those stupid security at the gate, it's just, I, I hate it. I cannot forgive them. I think they've spread that nuisance to the world. And I'm I'm glad to hear that that new, which is the new terminal? I forget the number that doesn't, apparently doesn't have that. They just have security at the beginning. Actually, I think that's a huge mistake because I think the thing that makes Singapore airport so much better than any airport in the world is precisely this. And you know why? Because it doesn't create these queues that you have everywhere else where you have to go through. You know, it creates, it's a funnel, right? It creates like a bottleneck. But in Singapore, you don't have that. And if you count it, you will realize that it has way many, 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 many more of the security, uh, you know, machines and all of this than any other airport because they have two in every gate. And you practically never queue to go through to that, right? Because there's just so many of them. And so you will never miss your flight either because of that, because it's at the last point. So they know who is there, right? So that's what makes Singapore airport so much more efficient that it's at the gate, right? So there's many more, there's many more of those machines to start with. (laughs) And also they are there. So you will never miss your flight because of that. So when I thought that the new airport had that, I was like, oh my God, like that's just like, it's removing what makes Singapore airport so efficient, right? I I never saw it from your perspective because it's just so quick. So I never, I never go to the gate earlier than I put, right? Because it's just like chop, chop, right? It's that and and, and the, the the carpets make me feel like a very sad casino. And I'm always there like connecting at three in the morning for something. And I feel like I'm a gambler who's just lost everything wandering around in this casino, forgetting the passage of time. So I, I you know, have... I met somebody, I met a company that does uh, fragrance for Changi ah. Airport. Ah. And they even sell it, you know? And ah. I, I always thought like, what is it that when I land in Changi, I always feel like I'm at home, you know? And, and you know, and I have this feeling also when I land in Barcelona, so it's just because it's my home. <laughs> Maybe it's just because it's my home. Sometimes I also have it in, in Dubai, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but. I think it's also because of the fragrance. And apparently they get a lot of people wanting to buy that fragrance that they put in Changi and they even bottle it and you can even buy it occasionally. So, you know, like it's, uh, it's the atmosphere as well that this is a sensorial experience, the, the whole in Changi airport. I never thought of the carpet, but you're right. It has that carpet of like the international chain in Las Vegas or like, yeah. even when you go to MBS, uh, Marina Bay Sands, it's the same sort of carpet, yeah. you know, in that, <laughs> that sort of like thick, like you can be anywhere if you don't look through the window you could be anywhere right like it's like thick and it's like orangey brownish you know? <laughs> okay so if we're going to talk about airports why are airports in spain always so hot in the winter they're so hot in the summer they're so hot i <laughs> really i never thought of that i can only speak for the barcelona airport because i don't really travel in spain for yeah. many many years maybe 20. um but barcelona airport i like because it's compact it's efficient as well right oh, it's a wonderful Despite... airport physically i love it but the temperature is, and i and in the u.s i know the airports are so cold and air-conditioned that's an extreme the other way but anytime i'm through barcelona madrid i just i just feel like i'm dripping <laughs> by the time I get to the gates and it's a wonderful airport. As you said, Barcelona is a wonderful airport, but gosh, it's hot. You just need to take clothes off. Maybe that's the incentive, you know, they just want people know, to take their clothes right. off. <laughs> that, 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 that is the key. So, uh, well, we're, we're, we're not here to, to totally go into airports, but, uh, 
uh, you've written the book on how to make money online. And uh, Ashley in the comments, when I uh, posted about our talk today, they, she said, wow, that's a lot of links. So you've got a lot of links. Uh, we're going to talk about making money online. So you've got You've got two websites, you've got uh, various social media accounts, you've got the book, uh, 30 Proven Ways to Make Money Online Without a Blog, and I'll, I'll share the, uh, the, the link in the comments here. Uh, you, I, I just learned you're, you're now running a, a solo female travel uh, Facebook group of 60,000 people, so you're, you're doing a ton. I don't even know where to begin. Let, let's start with the book, the genesis of the book and, and uh, what, what, what you're teaching people. Uh, it was an article on my blog about how to make money online, right? And I think that lots of people always wonder, um, you know, how do people make money online, you know? Like, how does it work? And do you need a blog and people associate the two? But there are there are lots of ways uh, that you can make money online without having a blog. For example, having a group, right? Uh, I mean, the group started without a, fa without a website and we're only launching the website at the end of this week or maybe Monday the latest. So that's really exciting. And I've been working on this uh, uh, very much intensely in the last month because we're, we're literally getting, getting this website live within five weeks, me and the other person that's doing this with me. So I do lots of things online. Once you start one business, I think that a lot of people have, uh, it's a combination of uh, shiny object syndrome, you know, like, oh, this is a really <laughs> cool thing and I'm just going to do it again. <laughs> and a little bit of like, you know, you, I am... I am a born entrepreneur. I got this from my father, who is a very successful entrepreneur. And so I, I cannot help but sit somewhere and like, oh, my God, like this is a great idea. And I totally want to do this. So I've invested in lots of businesses. I've started lots of businesses. I started lots of things. Many of them fail. And, you know, and you learn and you move on. And, and that's fine. And I have no problems failing. So I think this is probably what makes me different from most people. I really have like no concern failing and like telling people that, yeah, this is a workout. And I learn from it. So um, if you want to be an entrepreneur and you want to try lots of things you need to be not afraid to fail um so hopefully not everything fails and hopefully some things work out and you know you only need one to work out and they say that only 10 percent of startups uh, succeed anyway so if you get one winner that's fine so that means you need to start 10 businesses to get one successful one but how to make money uh, online we started because it's a very very common question that everybody always asks me and everybody right and when i had a full-time job people asked me less how I, how do I live from this? Because it was more like, you know, how, how does it work when you already have a full-time job and you work for Google or you're a consultant, people don't really ask you how, how do you pay for your bills because they understand how you pay for your bills. But they do ask you still like, so how does this thing work of having a, a blog? You know, like, how do you make money with this? People feel very okay asking such a thing to a complete stranger when you're in like a party or in an event. People will ask you this, right? Like, it's a common thing to ask. I never understood how it's so socially acceptable to ask a complete stranger how they make a living but people mm -hmm. feel like they can do that with a blogger uh, you would never ask a lawyer you know like so how much money do you make and how do you make money you know but in, a, in the online world people are very curious and they don't know how this works so it started to be like that and i wrote an article and then once i wrote the article then i realized well you know like why not the article became a really really big article so i made the article a bit smaller and then i turned it into a book nowadays making a book um, is quite easy right you can make a book uh, on amazon and then you know format it uh, formatted it so that you can just sell it on amazon and mm -hmm. admittedly some of the things have changed because the book is now a bit less than two years old so some of the things might have changed but the general the general philosophy and the general ways to make money are the same right People make money because they have a blog. They have, a, let's say, an entity online that you can make money with and that you can monetize. And that entity can be a blog or it can be a Facebook group or it can be whatever community. But there's all, many other ways to make money online without having a blog. Like you can have a dropship business and like just resell things. You can sell things on Amazon, on other platforms. You can you can really make a host of, uh, uh, of gener generate income through a host of uh, revenue streams no matter what you want. You just need to look at what your skill is and then see how you can monetize. Some people are really good at putting their voice over things, you know, and that's how they make money online. You know, they just put their voice over podcasts, you know, the intros and outros of podcasts, or they record books or they transcript um, recordings. So there's literally an endless amount of ways to make money online. Um, and mommy bloggers, for example, are one of the main things, you know, people who are housewives and then decide that they want to stay at home with their children or house husbands. They want to stay at home with their children and then they want to work online whenever they want. The common denominator is that you get the flexibility to, to work from anywhere on your own terms. And that's why I quit my full-time job to, to do this. And I think it's the same for you probably, Stefan, right? Like you just want the flexibility to work from wherever you want, whenever you want. And then it's about looking at what is it that you're good at and that you truly are passionate about and then seeing how you can monetize that and how you can make money from that by selling it online and by leveraging the tools that we have online. 
So uh, one of one of our listeners is uh, asking something that, that that may take a, a superpower. So Robert, is, <laughs> if my Spanish reading is correct, he's saying please, please uh, slow the pace. So the good news is this will be this will be available on replay, and I think you can tweak the the speed settings. I don't I don't think there's a way that we can stop the flood of incredible <laughs> information. So uh, we may have to do. Uh, but yeah, you know, we, it, I've got all my life. I got that. You know, when I was a consultant and I would give presentations to boards of directors, it was the same thing. <laughs> my boss would always go like in the background, going like, <laughs> and I try, you know, but I, I just speak very fast. And you know, Spanish is speaking. Is Roberto Spanish? Because uh, yeah, you see somebody said <laughs> Spanish have the same problem. Yes, I think it's a Spanish thing. I think that if you live in Asia, you realize you, you hear the same thing with Indians. When Indians speak, I always feel like, oh my god, they speak so fast. Um, <laughs> So I can I totally understand it. College, uh, for my second year, I was I volunteered to help uh, welcome international students, and uh, they paired me with a, a student from Singapore, and uh, and suddenly I was socializing with four or five uh, students, freshmen from Singapore, and it took me most of the first year to have any clue what they were saying. It was, and I speak Mandarin because Chinese. Because of English? Because of English or because of fast Yeah, it was like. You know, it's it's there's elements of of Hokkien, there's elements of of Mandarin nowadays, there's elements of different Indian languages, and it's like, to my ears, the emphasis in every word is on the wrong syllable, plus all the other stuff they're adding in from the, and it just took so hard to train my ear to, and then I started loving it, but it was the, it was a big thing. So I, I think for I think for Robert Robert that we will. We will find a format where I can get out of the way and we can do this in Spanish with somebody who can properly engage with you in Spanish. And I think we see her in the listening, D-A-N-A-Y, uh, who I'm trying to get on this program, is uh, would be a perfect uh, interlocutor, uh, high speed for, for you two to do a Spanish session. So we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll put that together. We'll try to make that happen. Uh, we'll, we'll continue in English. We'll continue at the at the pace we're comfortable so um are you are you avoiding to pronounce her name i am assuming it's an i but maybe uh, it, it's a little bit of an inside joke yeah so uh i, I was on a <laughs> webinar yesterday and, and she was being shy and i've been trying to convince her to be on here so i it was on zoom so it just showed the first name so i spelled out the first name uh for everybody to embarrass her just a little bit to encourage her to come on and and do her talk. I don't think she's a wallflower by nature, but uh, we're hoping to have her in the coming weeks. So, uh, uh, awesome. Uh, I'll be looking yeah. forward to, to watching that one as well. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so, so one of the things, uh, speaking of blogs, and and uh, well, you, you've got you've got two sites, and uh, once in a lifetime journey. I, would I have say, four sites actually. Four sites. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I didn't put in enough links, so I know once in a lifetime journey. I know. I know you're uh, Singapore and beyond. Uh, what what have I missed? So that's what happens when you put a blogger in lockdown. You know, they just uh, create more blogs. <laughs> <laughs> well, suddenly I'm not traveling, so I have 40% more time at home because usually I travel 40, 45% of the year. And then on top of that, because I'm not traveling, I don't have to write about the trips that I've taken. So I'm like, oh my god, I have all this time. And so I decided, and obviously, I'm in the travel industry, so my income has dropped to you know significantly so I, i'm trying to diversify into other things so the first thing that i did was to start a food blog so i mm -hmm. will keep that one to myself even though it's live just because i want to get it a bit better before i start telling people uh, i put it live uh, but it's a food blog about uh, uh breakfast things that you don't need to cook much usually because i travel so much my fridge is empty only has wine that i buy from my trips my father makes wine so i like to buy wine from everywhere there's mm -hmm. literally no food in my fridge ever but now suddenly i have like i'm slowly drinking my wine and replacing it with vegetables <laughs> So I'm trying to I'm trying to cook I'm starting to cook more because I cannot order food. It's just a nightmare to order food in Singapore. It's just not possible. So I'm cooking a lot. And then the fourth one is the Solo Female Travelers. Uh, it's solofemaletravelers.club, which is literally the, the site is live now, but it has a, a work in progress uh, page. Um, but it will go live on Monday, Tuesday, and it's for this other group that I'm launching with my friend. And it's going to be an awesome an awesome website because it's going to be a resource for solo female uh, travelers to travel. Right. So uh, some of them are like. Really really like hardcore travelers and I've referred quite a few of them to the group actually uh, but some of them have never traveled alone before and really want to do it but they come from societies or places where it's not so common I think that uh, being in the group and managing the group has given me 
this perspective that I had forgotten, you know, like I have a very easy passport to travel with. I've been traveling for 25 years. I can afford it. Uh, you know, like I have a lot, it's very easy for me to travel and I don't have problems traveling alone also because I've done it many times and I always believe that safety can be bought. So if you have money, you can stay safe no matter where, right? Because you can always pay a guide and pay a driver. It's much harder when you're backpacking and you know, if you come from a place where your passport is not easy and you come from a very conservative society where your parents are really worried about what people will think of their daughter traveling alone. So I, I, I like the group because it gives me all this perspective. And we want to provide these resources to women who don't know how to convince their parents to let them travel solo, don't know how to organize their first trip, don't know how to keep safe, don't know lots of things. So it's, it's gonna be an amazing website and I'm quite excited about that one. The other two, the main blogs that I had, uh, Once in a Lifetime Journey started in 2014. So it's, six, it's a bit more than six years old now. And then I started Singapore and Beyond, focusing more a little bit on Singapore, uh, but then I really realized that actually my main blog started to have a lot of weight on Singapore content as well. So it was kind of hard to segment and differentiate the two. Uh, also, it's a very competitive environment. There's lots of publications writing about Singapore, like really large publications. So it's a very competitive market. So I would say that's a place that I realized later on that maybe it wasn't so much making so much sense to segment the two. Uh, but yeah, four, four websites. But tell, tell us about you know? Singapore and beyond in Singlish. James Go wants to hear your Singlish. <laughs> uh, my only English words are uh, very, they are very, you know, from every place I live in, I always take some words that I think cannot be translated, you know. I will always keep saying inshallah because I think that the meaning of inshallah is less mm -hmm. like, you know, it's something that only if you live in the Middle East, you know what it really means, right? It, yeah, God willing, yeah, it means like it will never happen, right? Especially if you work in the Middle East. <laughs> if somebody says, are you going to do this? Yeah, inshallah, you know, no, the answer is no. <laughs> so it's like a word that's very useful and I still use it. From Singapore, I think that something that's very useful here is kiasu. The word kiasu is like, you know, like, Singapore and my, my partner is Singaporean and Indian Singaporean. He always, uh, he always tells me I'm very kiasu. Kiasu is kind of like, you know, you, it's hard to explain, but it's like you cannot wait, you know, like you're impatient. And Singaporeans are very kiasu. Um, and the other word that's like very useful in Singapore is Kpo. Kpo is the other thing that's like super, like super Singaporean. People here is that this formal mentality, you know, it's like there's this new place that sells, I don't know, ice cream with uh, fried pork ribs. <laughs> I'm inventing it, huh? but it's like a major craze. And then people are queuing for like three days to get that. And they need to be mm -hmm. the first one of their friends to do that. That's a very Singaporean thing. I, the whole lockdown situation was kind of like already in the works. And I live in front of um, Shake Shack. Um, when they opened the first Shake Shack in the airport and at Jewel, the queue was insane. It was literally going around the whole Jewel airport, you know? Like mm. I actually took two minutes to walk the queue just, and I was <laughs> doing a live, but I was like so shocked. And they opened one in front of me in the midst of all this lockdown and people mm. still queue. People queue when it opens to get Shake Shack, you know? That's a very Singaporean thing. McDonald's will give a new whatever toy with their Big Macs and people queue at midnight so that they're the first ones that are like, you know, when the, when the thing starts, that's a very Singaporean thing. So Kpo and Kiasu are my most favorite words here. They are very Singaporean and they also, I think, describe me a little bit sometimes. So they are my two uh, Singlish words, the most that I like here. And on Singapore and beyond, I, I've often heard at, at different, uh, say, travel blog events, the the, the argument made that that a, a blogger should really specialize in a destination like, like a Singapore instead of say the, the typical EPS user might want to blog about their you know they, they're visiting every country so they've been to each one once and they just have one post but it, it sounds like uh, either either maybe that approach is flawed or just that Singapore is saturated and, and uh, uh, you've you've found a generalist approach is working better. No, I, I think that you are right. You need to niche down because nowadays, I mean, I started my blog six years ago, but then it wasn't as, as competitive as it is now at all. Uh, and it, you know, I have friends who started 10 years ago and that was not as competitive. And, and if you see many of the really successful bloggers that started a long time ago, so they built the authority and the everything when this was not a popular thing. I met uh, a couple of months ago, I met a, a blogger at Changi Airport. He was on transit uh, who started his blog in 96. Like when it was not even like it was like a Yahoo domain thing he was mm. telling me. So imagine if you started back then. Now he still has it, obviously, and you know he's one of the go-to resources. But nowadays, if you're gonna start another backpacking in Southeast Asia blog, just don't because you're gonna waste your time. It's impossible that you're gonna beat everybody else out there. You need to niche down as much as possible. The thing about Singapore is that is it's a very competitive place. So there are already lots of blogs about Singapore. 
So, and, and websites and proper like publications, right? So even though it's a lucrative market, um, I was probably a bit late and I should have put much more effort to do it. You can, you can still do it, but I think there's too much competition nowadays. And, and I just realized that my main blog was still ranking for all sorts of Singapore content anyway. So it wasn't so, dif so mm -hmm. easy for me to differentiate the two. So it was like a portfolio management type of um, uh, concern. And on top of that, the fact that it's a very competitive place. But definitely you need to niche down and niche down as much as possible. If you can focus on family, family, uh, um, a family blog in Singapore instead of Singapore, or uh, you know, a singles blog in Singapore instead of just Singapore, much better. Um, and there's lots of people starting niche down blogs nowadays, right? Like with the travel situation being what it is, uh, everybody agrees in the industry that domestic travel will, will be the first thing that will start. And so people are diversifying by, by starting destination blogs um, that are specific to a city. Also, it's much easier to find partners to work with when you have a very defined niche. My main block is luxury. Luxury and out of the ordinary travel, like meaning the type of travel that I did being a consultant, right? You're traveling five-star hotels, but then you also like to go to you know, a really random place that people don't go to. Then that, that is far too wide and it's global. So it's harder to find partners to work with than say if I wrote about, if I just wrote about, for example, places nobody goes to, right? There's a couple of EPS members who I know who are bloggers, who are successful. Um, uh, actually, he's Catalan. Uh, and he writes about places that people don't go to, right? Like how to travel in Saudi or to Iraq or things like that. And there's a niche for that, right? Because not a lot of people go to, and when they go to, they want specific information. There's not a lot of competition. You can develop ties and partnerships with local operators and things like that, rather than just go to booking.com and be an affiliate. So it can be a much more focused uh, blog if you write about things that there's less audience, but the audience is much more engaged. And there are lots of niches where there's people are passionate about really that niche. For example, wine, people are really passionate about wine, right? So mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're getting into a niche that people are really passionate about, you're also gonna get much more engagement, much more you know, interaction with the community just because people are really passionate about that. Some sports are the same thing, you know, like people really love golf. So, you mm -hmm. know, they're like, they might read everything that there is about this just because they really love it and they're really passionate about it. And you're speaking from a, a, a position of uh, tremendous expertise. You're a, you're a former Googler, and I, I also see in the audience Alex Miller, who's a, an SEO expert I know. And I, if you can characterize some of the comments you made about being niche, I think it's uh, lessons I've been learning is about you know, good content is important, but if you don't have the SEO, then it's almost impossible these days for anybody to find it, no matter how much the, you know, the term organically you try to get it. That, that this niche is related to getting to the top of, of Google results and how important that is. So I'm, I'm not the expert, uh, you, you are. Can you speak to how that niche content plays into getting, getting those important search engine rankings? I mean, every, Google will tell you and you know, most of the CEO people will tell you that good content, the most important thing is to write good content, right? That that's the number one thing and that if, it, if your content is really good, it is better than that it's out there, Google will find it. But that's not really true always, just because it's very competitive and you know, your content can be really, really good, but your competitor, or, and by competitor, I mean somebody who would be writing about the same thing, might do that plus all the other SEO things. So you know, he's going to be better than you. If you really niche down and you become an expert in something, you will become the go-to person for that thing. So you're more likely to get others to refer you, to link to you, to build your authority on that topic. So it also helps with SEO just because you're well known as that, right? So mm -hmm. if you are, and you can see it in the group, right? You know that um, if there's a specific destination that somebody is a real expert in, people always go to that person. Or there's people who are always known for certain aspects of travel or who really love, I don't know, maps or geography or really obscure places that people don't know anything about. So those people, if you translate that concept to the online world, it's the same as you have a friend who is really good at X, right? And really like passionate about X. Probably your friends think that you are the really go-to person for travel, right? My friends think that I'm the go-to mm -hmm. person for luxury resorts, right? So mm -hmm. they'll ask me if like, oh, you know, like what is the best resort in whatever country to go to? And I'll know because it's something I'm passionate about. So when you become the go-to person for that, in the online world is the same. If you really become well-known for that, you should be getting more referrals because people know that you're really good at that. But it's harder and harder to like stand out when there's so many people talking about that. So the more specific you are, the more of an authority you can become in that thing. It's very hard to become an expert in luxury travel because it's a very wide topic. It's, it's niche, but it's wide, right? If I became a luxury expert in Singapore, 
that's really niche, right? So then people really know that I am that and start to recognize me as somebody who, who knows that. So whenever the press wants to get an expert to talk about that, they might reach out to me, you know, like it's this whole thing. So eventually you build your SEO around that. If you're looking for natural ways to, to, link, to build your SEO, right? So becoming an expert and becoming known as an authority for something is a great way to do that. But, you know, you should always write good content because even if you write shitty content and you do all the other things to try to make it rank, it happens, right? Like many times in travel, you will Google, Google something and you will see the first page is full of rubbish content. Yeah, it's they'll like the 10 best waterfall sites that, that have the 10 best waterfalls in every country. And, and the person who has written the article has not been there. The pictures are crowdsourced. They've stolen pictures from, like, you know, it's, it's rubbish content and you can still find it, particularly in travel, because there's lots of these companies that will do all sorts of black, uh, black hat uh, SEO techniques and they will outrank you. That's why it doesn't always work to have the best content. It happens many times. When I write an article, it, I will always make sure that it is the best that is out there, but I'm not always number one. Because there's all these people playing all these black black hat tricks and all these like uh, tricks, right? So but the more niche down you are, the more of an expert you can become on something, and the more you start appearing in in search results because you're known for that. The more people in your community will know you, the more the press will refer to you, and so it's easier to be the expert on that. The more niche down it is. How much? Uh, l l let's talk about your luxury travel site. How much uh, is the breakdown of the time you spend of, of creating the content versus the uh, the SEO aspects, the social media promotion? What's 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 the rough balance? So I have a person working for me full time, and he has been working for me for four years, something like that. So he manages all the um, administrative part of uh, of the blog. So he will upload the articles. I do ninety five percent of the writing. He's a South African living in Korea married to a Korean, so he writes the Korean and South African content for me. But other than that, I write all the other content myself. I very rarely do I have a, a guest writer, so I do all the writing. Uh, I also do all the social media except for Pinterest. He manages Pinterest because I think it's less social and more about sharing and things like that. I manage Facebook and Instagram. I'm not a huge person on social. Um, I started early, but then all the algorithm changes and everything. It's a really time consuming task that doesn't bring me a lot of uh, revenue. So I try to limit it as much as I can. Um, and now I do a little bit less on that blog just because travel is not resuming anytime soon. So there's mm -hmm. less of the, let's say like content that I'm urgently publishing. Um, but I would say in a normal listen, like two months ago, if you had asked me two months ago, I would say I spend 40% of the time traveling and doing while I'm traveling, I'll do like things that need to be done to keep the business running. Let's say, um, my, my staff keeps the lights on and does all the other administrative tasks. I manage social media and I do all the writing. So that would take 80% of my day. Apart from those four websites, by the way, I also consult to businesses in the travel industry. So I also do that on the site. Um, so I, as a consultant, I would help them when they want to do anything to do with content or SEO or influencer marketing or content marketing or social things like that. So I will also do projects related to that. And I've been doing quite a few on the site. So I would say that takes maybe 20, 30% of my time and 70, 80% is, uh, is managing the blog. Um, and mostly that is the writing and the social media. I also mostly edit my photos, either that or my best friend might edit them. And he, if he's traveling with me, he's very good at that. Um, and he's been to way more countries than me even. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit my split. Fantastic. And, and about social media platforms, you mentioned Pinterest. I I, I generally forget that Pinterest exists, but I also know that a lot of people actively use it. Uh, uh, you said it's not a key one to your routine, but but you're willing to pay someone to work on it for you. So how do you make uh, Pinterest work for your business? I'm not really huge on Pinterest, but I know that a lot of travel bloggers, and particularly travel, travel, fashion, interior design, food is huge on Pinterest because that's the sort of thing that people look for in Pinterest. Pinterest is very big in the US. Um, I am not so much of a social media person. I dislike Pinterest and all the other social media. I think that, you know, except for managing the Facebook group and for keeping updated on things in the industry through the Facebook groups that I am part of, um, I really spend no time on social media. I think it's a waste of my time. It brings me nothing for my business. For Pinterest, we have a routine that uh, that my staff does. So he just like schedules pins. I use a scheduling tool. That's what pretty much everybody does. So he schedules mm -hmm. pins. We create pins. We decide what sort of content will do well on Pinterest. Again, because I write about places nobody goes to, um, those places are not going to do well on Pinterest. Nobody cares on Pinterest about going to Somalia. I can tell you. <laughs> just because the average user on Pinterest is more likely to pin a recipe to make banana bread than <laughs> <laughs> you know, how to go to Somalia. So you should not 
So we need making banana yeah, that's bread in Mogadishu. It's not the eat. audience. <laughs> Definitely, you're not going to get anybody to pit it. <laughs> if, they, if, if I trick them into thinking it's about banana bread, but uh, how about LinkedIn? Uh, uh, I've, I've, I've struggled with this a bit where I do consulting in my uh, my traditional corporate industry still, which has nothing to do with travel. Uh, and LinkedIn is really good when you do one thing in life, but it seems very difficult to use it effectively when you do two very different things. So if I'm spending 10 or 20 percent of my time in the travel area, I've, I've really put nothing travel related except in a few credentials, like I'm on the board of directors of Traveler Century Club, but I don't put anything because I feel like it'll just distract people. And, and other than people with mutual connections popping up, there's, there's nothing really there. Do you, do you have a prescription for how to how to have two two U's in LinkedIn and make it work? I think, I mean, I'm obviously I'm a little, I mean, like you, right? Mm -hmm. I have uh, most of my LinkedIn uh, network. I mean, I started, I was looking at it the other day. I, I started my LinkedIn account in 2007 or something like that, right? So it's been around for a really long time and it started as my corporate link to my clients in the telecom industry. Then at Google, I added all the other, and mind you, these are two very different businesses and very different jobs already, right? So whoever I had in the telco industry has nothing to do with whoever I have from my Google time again. So that's a second career. And now I also have lots of people in the travel world. And that's, again, two different types of sub industries because it's clients and people working in the travel, the traditional travel industry, plus all the online entrepreneurs, online uh, nomad, uh, digital nomads, bloggers, and so on. So I would say I have four different profiles. So mm. I interact with a little bit of everything. So I still follow a little bit the telco industry. I don't engage with it so much because it's an industry that unless you know the technicalities and, and you're up to date, you don't really, you're not really much able to contribute much. And it's been seven years that I'm not in the telco industry. So I can't really contribute to a discussion on 5G because I don't really know what's going on. And occasionally I'll ask my best friend who still is in the travel industry to give me a bit of an update when we chat and so on. I'm, I'm still, uh, you know, it, interested in the industry, but I can't participate in it anymore. But I have a very large amount of connection coming from that right um, then in the digital world Google um, travel and so on I, I feel like there are a lot of topics that are still common so I follow topics and I engage in conversations that I think are interesting around digital marketing around social media and around advertising around the travel industry um, so I try to engage by topic and I find that LinkedIn is very good to solidify your credibility, especially if you've been in the corporate world for, for a really long time, you have a good profile, you have a good career. I think it's like a very good place to have your profile and your and your CV online and have a very, you know, a place to show your experience and who you really are from a professional point of view. I feel like when brands that I might work with as a blogger see my LinkedIn profile, it kind of like boosts my credibility. In the world of blogging, there's a lot of inexperienced people and there's a lot of unprofessionalism unfortunately right and that gives a bad name to everybody so when people go and see my linkedin profile i feel like it, it already they see me in a very different way right because they see like ah okay this person worked at google she was a management consultant she was this they already like they realize that i am older to start with they realize that i've had a long career in corporate they see that i have an mba they see everything and then they see me in very different light so I find mm -hmm. that it's a very good thing to kind of like build your credibility. Mm -hmm. And then it's a good place to engage with uh, like-minded people. And I've had lots of opportunities come from that, especially in speaking arrangements, for example, LinkedIn is good for that as well. It's a place where you can like show that your profile and like connect from a speaking uh, perspective point of view. Any speaker, any person I meet in a conference, I immediately add them to LinkedIn. I don't add them as Facebook friends, you know, yeah. like, and, and some, when I see that people add, start adding me as Facebook friends, I kind of try to limit my Facebook to my personal life. And so LinkedIn is where I would put all my professional. And there is where I have professional conversations. So I try to share knowledge as well. What has worked for me on LinkedIn, and I don't actively use it to drive business, but what has worked for me in LinkedIn is um, share learnings, you know, like in my day-to-day -day, things that I might have learned that I think could be useful to my connections, I share it. And oftentimes I'll see likes and comments from people in the telco world for whom this is completely irrelevant from the day-to-day -day business, but they find it interesting. And they'll still encourage me and they'll still like, you know, like we like that you've changed career a couple of times and that you're doing something that you're passionate about and your passion comes through in your comments and things that you share. So I use LinkedIn for that. Share learnings that I think will be useful for everybody. Like this last week I made a, a post about managing Facebook groups and some of the things that I learned from managing a, a large group. This is a time when people are 
more and more looking for connections. We're all alone. We're all isolated, right? Many people are completely by themselves. So connecting online like, like this that we're doing now, right? It's useful mm -hmm. for a lot of people and groups are growing a lot and they're a place that people turn to. So it might be a good time to start a group if you've never started it before. So I shared some learnings from managing a large group and, you know, the downsides and the things that you need to consider. In the past, I've shared learnings on uh, campaigns. I've shared um, when I've done a really successful campaign with a client, I've shared a sort of case study and a sort of like, this is why this campaign was so successful. And this has worked a lot because it's a way to promote what you've done while you're giving value to people. You can't just, I think that in LinkedIn, it doesn't work to just always talk about yourself. It's not a place where people go to hear about your latest updates and your latest article that you publish. I don't do that. I go there to share things that I think will be useful from a professional point of view. So from the business side of blogging. And these posts you're sharing, you're sharing in groups or you're sharing directly on, on your profile and are they... And are they yeah, public or do they need to be your connections or is there an option to toggle between them? Actually, I'm not sure. I think that you can see what people have published, right? Uh, I don't think LinkedIn, it's a good point. They must, <laughs> no, they must be public. They must be public because when I talk, I see the likes from people that are not my connections. So definitely they are public. The hashtags will, will bring them up, so use the hashtags. Tag other companies or other people that might be involved because then their connections will also see your post. Um, so yeah, this has worked for me. For ex And every time that I make a post, uh, you can see the reach, you can see how many people like it. The statistics mm -hmm. will disappear after 30 days. And then you can also like uh, see like you know other people that might you might have reached. And th there's always new, new people connecting, wanting to connect with me after I make this post because then maybe what, I, what I'm sharing resonates with them and they're like, oh, you know, like there can be business opportunities that come from that so i use it like that but i use it very altruistically i don't post thinking like oh you know if i post these then maybe i'll get enough no i generally post things that i think would be useful and uh you so i guess there, there is one social media if you count linkedin that that isn't a waste of time for you and uh uh, yes, I LinkedIn, I go to keep updated. So that's yeah. actually the place where I go to stay up to date with the industry. So I try to follow hashtags and companies that I'm interested about. So I kind of like, I kind of have this professional discussion that as a blogger is kind of hard, harder to have from a more professional business point of view and from a more wider point of view than just like, you know, my traffic is down, what can I do? So these sort of conversations are the ones that I have on LinkedIn. And, and you, I, I, I've not seen that many bloggers that, that have created a company page on LinkedIn. So your once in a lifetime journey does have its own uh, corporate Yeah, I don't really use it. I don't really use it. I'm, I'm not super active on LinkedIn. Uh, I should I should be more. I think it has a lot of potential. A lot of people will say and video and the algorithm still doesn't work against you like, like it does in other places. So if you post videos, you will still get quite a lot of reach. I haven't really gotten to it, but Lots of bloggers are not on LinkedIn to start with. Um, they, a lot of them start young, so they never really had the corporate career where LinkedIn made more sense, where you would have to look for a job and LinkedIn is a good place to have your profile and your CV online. Uh, and then lots of them will not have a, a, a company page. I would encourage people to do it. It's one of the things I have on my to-do list. I, I, I wouldn't put myself as an example of somebody who is like super successful on it. I just have these few tips that, I, that are things that I've seen work and I use it for that. I use it to stay up to date with the industry news. I use it to stay connected with professional connections that I would otherwise not be connected with, especially if, if they are not in my same country. And I use it to share learnings that I think might be useful for other people with a very long-term view that helping others will eventually come back to me is something that I believe in business in general. I always like to help other people if I can, even if there's nothing in it for me. And speaking of, um, uh, oh, so James Martin is just adding about, uh, Sales yes, Navigator. solo female travelers. Yeah. I see that you answered the question. Sales Navigator. Uh... Yes, you know, I see a lot. Uh, I see a lot of, uh, and I was chatting this uh, with a friend of mine recently. I see a lot of people. Uh, I see the activity levels in in LinkedIn increasing drastically in the last month, right? First of all, I guess there's a lot of people with them on their hands. There's a lot of people who might be laid off or have been furloughed mm -hmm. and like, you know, just more people looking for careers. I see, I receive way more direct messages nowadays than I did before. Um, and some of them, and, and I think that what I like about LinkedIn is that there's no spam that I don't get spam with messages, that people cannot contact me unless they are a paid user. And even then LinkedIn filters quite a lot of the things that you can do. So I like that about LinkedIn, that when I, when I receive an email and when I receive a message, it's usually tailored. But in the recent couple of weeks, yeah, literally the last couple of weeks, I'm seeing more and more spam and I'm starting to dread that LinkedIn is gonna become that place where I just get bombarded by sales pitches. And, mm. and it's fine, I think it's fine as long as your pitch is tailored. 
So I would recommend, and that's just my personal recommendation. I would recommend that if you want to reach out to somebody with any sales pitch, and when I say sales, I mean anything, anything that you want from that person and anything that you want to sell to them, whether it's an idea or a product or anything, then you try to get an introduction. Just find somebody that you have a friend in common. You know, the six degrees of separation is not that hard that you will find somebody, you will know somebody who knows that person. And then try to get an introduction from that person. So there's already a filter and you already know what that person is doing with their life. So somebody who reached out to me with a pitch for something that's unrelated, it's a waste of my time. And I try to always reply to 100% of the people who reach out to me on LinkedIn because that's how I view LinkedIn. But if I start to receive a lot of unsolicited and irrelevant messages, I will stop doing that. So I would say, do everything you can to make sure that if you're reaching to somebody, you're reaching, understanding what it is that they do. So if you're reaching to me because you want to do something that's about solo female travelers and you know that I manage this group, that's great. If you're wanting to reach to me because you want to invite me to go to a resort in Greece for the weekend, but you don't know that I live in Singapore. You haven't even paid attention to the fact that I don't live in Europe, so I'm not going to go to Greece for the weekend, right? Yeah. So, you know, it's that sort of like the very basics in LinkedIn, I think, are way more uh, important than anywhere else because the spamming just doesn't work on LinkedIn. People will call you out. I see people calling others out a lot on LinkedIn. So eventually somebody will call you out and somebody will very bluntly tell you that you're just spamming them. So just don't do it on LinkedIn. Just find a connection. And Tanai is uh, asking about uh, solo female travelers. So that's a group you took, you didn't found, but you took over in January. Is that right? Yeah, I didn't found it. A friend of mine founded it. I've been there since the beginning. A friend of mine founded it, but I took over the management in January with a friend, uh, beginning of February. So what's it like managing a group of 60,000 people? And uh, um, uh, like there's, a, there's a clear niche of, of the travel there, but I'm sure just as wide of topics as, as anywhere in travel. Yes, I mean, there's a lot of conversation, um, as I was mentioning to you earlier, about one third of the members of the group have never traveled before. That's our mm -hmm. estimate, but also because we ask new members. Um, so one third have never traveled before solo. So there's a lot of concern and a lot of worry and a lot of fear around traveling solo just because of what you hear and what everybody tells you, right? You ask any solo female traveler what their parents or their friends said the first time that they said, I'm going to travel by myself. And for sure they heard you are crazy and for sure they heard you're going to be killed, raped, robbed and a host of other things. And I have been to maybe 40 countries on my own and nothing of the like has ever happened to me, right? I, I don't think I've ever felt in danger traveling solo. I think the most I've ever felt in danger, I was actually not solo. I was with my best friend who is a 185 uh, British guy that weighs 90 kilos, you know? So I was definitely not alone. And mm -hmm. Those are the only times I've ever been felt a little bit unsafe. Solo, I've never felt unsafe. Of course, you need to be careful, just like you would be careful anywhere else. A lot of the same, in my opinion, a lot of the same advice applies when you're traveling to other places. And if you live in Singapore, you should be careful no matter where you travel, because here it's so safe that you forget that if you leave the bag in the chair next to yours in a restaurant, it will disappear. It will disappear in Spain. You know, my mom is always chasing after me. Don't leave your bag, don't leave your bag. Because I forget because in Singapore, you can hang it at the back of your chair. It will be there, you know. But in Spain, you do that and watch, right? One minute, it's gone. So mm -hmm. a lot of the same advice applies to other places. And I always think that, unfortunately, there's a lot of correlation between money and safety, right? If you have money, you can buy safety. If you don't have money to pay for a driver and a car to take you around, um, then you need to find other ways to stay safe. And common sense goes a long way for most things, right? You know, don't flash your stuff around, don't carry your camera around. But as a female solo traveler, I've always felt that people are incredibly friendly and incredibly nice. And I've been invited everywhere. I mean, last solo trip that I took was to Mexico City. I spent 10 days by myself. And Mexico City is not the world's safest place, right? And I stand out as a foreigner. People know I'm a foreigner. Everybody assumed I was American. Everybody talked to me in English. Um, and the locals, every time I would take the camera out to take a picture, because it's my job, right? I need to take pictures. I'm a travel blogger. So I would take the camera and I would be very careful. I had it tied around my, my wrist and I would take a picture. There would be some local who would stop me and would say, be careful with your camera. Every time, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, that says a lot about the locals, right? They don't want a foreigner to be robbed. They don't want a, a woman to be robbed. And if you're a solo female, people will come to talk to you. They're still surprised. They're still fascinated. They're still interested. They will ask you if you're alone. And they don't ask because they want to rob you. They ask because they're interested. They're like, oh, my God, they're curious. You know, where are you from? Why are you traveling alone? What do you think of their country? You know, these are all things that I found that 
I've been asked everywhere and people are always friendly and always helpful. And I get invited in restaurants if I'm alone, you know, people will, families, I'm not talking about creepy guys, I'm talking about families and couples will invite me over because they're curious about uh, hearing my story. They want their children to hear about this uh, solo woman that's traveling alone, you know? So I, I think it's a very empowering uh, uh, thing to do, but a lot of people are afraid. So that's the number one topic of conversation is safety around places. And then you always, it's interesting because it doesn't matter where the question is from, whether it's safety in Morocco, in India, in Egypt, in the US, in India, a- anywhere. Like it doesn't matter where it is. You, li- you read through the comments and there are always people who will say, go, it's safe, it doesn't matter. Just take precautions to take at home. There's always somebody who will say, do not go, it's super unsafe. And, and, and there's always a certain amount of people who will have had bad experiences. So, and that will happen everywhere, you know? Whenever I say I'm from Barcelona, I always get amazingly positive comments. But everybody recently always has somebody they know that has been robbed in La Ramblas, you know? And I think it's, it's really sad. It makes me like really upset. But it happens, it happens a lot, unfortunately. And it, it's something that happens everywhere. But it's funny that it doesn't matter where it is. The comments are always the same, you know? So you cannot give universal advice. You just need to look at the facts, look at the data, look at the real statistics so that you don't you know form opinions based on subjective things or opinions of others and then understand that what the reality is and take the necessary measures like you would anywhere else and you've I mean, this is a great entree to your earlier career I mean, you've lived in in dubai then you relocated to johannesburg because you were commuting as a management consultant all over africa you spent significant time in nigeria a country that people would most most travelers would have grave concerns about or they've heard the stories you you spent significant time i mean really all over the continent sudan tanzania kenya talk talk for for young young aspiring business travelers men or women in the group that that want to take on that kind of global role what what was that like and what did it do for your early career i think that uh, moving abroad and leaving spain and moving to dubai and having a job that required me to travel every week is the best decision I ever made. Um, I took the job even though I was not a consultant. I knew nothing about consulting. I knew nothing about the telco industry. I knew nothing about Dubai. In fact, I was looking for the guidebook to Dubai in the Africa section. That's how bad it was. Uh, of course, it's a long time ago. And I was like, what is Dubai? I cannot find it. <laughs> Very bad. Uh, and, and it was the best thing that I did. I did it because I wanted to live abroad. I wanted to travel. And that was what I loved the most about my job. I also love the job because it's glamorous when you're working when in, in, as a consultant, you're traveling business class, you're staying at five star hotels, you know, like you get all these points. It's, it's just great, right? It's, it's great for your personal uh, life. It's very glamorous. Everybody thinks like you live this chat setting life, but also if you're a consultant in the telco industry, you generally have a glamorous job, you know, like what you do affects the entire country. Right? In, in that time, whatever decision we would take, if we would launch a new price plan or if we would launch a new product, the entire country would know about it, right? I remember reviewing prices, taking interim positions as marketing directors in some of the operators, reviewing some prices in Swahili or in like, you know, Arabic and things like that. And then your ad is everywhere in the streets, right? It, it's absolutely everywhere. There are billboards everywhere. It's in all TVs, the telecom operators at the time, they are the ones with the biggest budgets. They are the ones with the largest advertising campaigns. So anything you would do would impact the lives of millions so it's glamorous from that point of view it's interesting it's fascinating it was an exciting time to be in africa because nobody had a phone so suddenly in two years everybody had phones so you really had a huge impact and also it's a very jet setting and glamorous life so i thought it was amazing right that i was 26 27 28 you know like i was like, oh my god like i'm living the life and and my life is so exciting and it was exciting and it looked exciting so it was great right but i also think it was an amazing opportunity to see countries that i would not have ever understood or seen as a traveler the same way i did as working there it's a very different perspective when you're working in sudan when you're working in kenya when you're working in tanzania in zambia in south africa in nigeria than when you're actually going there as a tourist you just have a very different perspective i think this happens everywhere but in africa is the divide is way bigger Just because what you see as a tourist, you're literally just checking off into a resort or a lodge somewhere. You will see very few things. You will not interact really with the day-to-day of the people. The capitals in Africa sometimes are very dangerous, so people spend very little time there. There's less to see. So you will arrive in Kenya and you will maybe spend one afternoon in Nairobi and you will get out of there and you will go to a safari place. Whereas I was spending my days in Nairobi, right? 
every day and you know and in Nairobi there's a national park so I remember going to, to, to a safari in my suit before going to work or mm -hmm. looking through the window my client office was in front of the safari like on the road that comes from the airport um, and so we would look through the window and see giraffes on the other side of the road which is was the national park right so these sort of things were just like exciting these are memories that will stay with me forever so I think this is the best decision I ever took the amount of perspective tolerance and respect for other cultures that I gained from doing that something that I will carry with me everywhere. So I would encourage anybody to do that. Of course, you need to understand that when you're traveling every single week, it's very hard to have a personal life. Like what sort of relationship can you have when you're never there, right? And I had a relationship with somebody who was also a consultant at the time. So we would be in two separate points. I remember going to Manila, he would go to Nigeria. We were 18 hours apart, right? And then we would come in the weekend and we had opposite jet lags. I would wake up at six, he'd wake up at noon. You know, it's, it's very, very difficult to have a relationship when you're a consultant and you're traveling every week. Because even when you're not traveling, you're working very long hours. So it's, it's very hard. So you have to do it when you're young. At some point, like it happened to me, you realize that, hey, you're 32 and you don't really have a lot of friends where you live because you're never here. Uh, and it's hard to keep a relationship and you also get tired. Traveling every week is, is physically tiring, right? It, it's, it's great, but it's physically tri tiring even if you're flying business class, you know, the jet lag every single weekend. It becomes tiring on your body, right? So there's a lot of things that you need to consider. Yeah, but I, five, I think it's the seven best hour decision. flights, eight hour flights even you're taking there and back yeah. every week i mean it's uh it's just, I, I, for a while i commuted when my wife was studying in new york it was four weeks beijing one week new york and i just hated that week and and uh, it was just so hard and to think about doing that every every week and then i commuted between atlanta and new york and i, I still get just shudders when i think of that yeah. 6 a.m laguardia to atlanta flight on monday i just uh, i now i see the consultants at the hotel breakfast and they're you can always tell the consultants because they can't even have their yogurt for a few minutes a piece. They're on their laptop and there's always three of them and they never say anything <sighs> facing each other. They're all staring at their laptop and, and talking out of the side of their mouth. So you know, you know, they're the consultants. <laughs> and, yes. Uh, you can I can tell a consultant from like a mile away I'm like, oh, you know, this guy works for McKinsey. I can even tell the consultancy, you know, just because of the way they look. <laughs> which uh, which consultancies people stick out the most? Like, <laughs> well, you can always tell the difference between more of the operational type of consulting, like uh, an Accenture or a KPMG or a Deloitte, versus the more management consulting, like a BCG or a Bain or a McKinsey. You can usually tell the difference. Um, just you know, yeah, like, like obviously, this is have the uh, have the laptop backpack from an Oracle conference or something. <laughs> yes, yes, you will never find a McKinsey guy with an Oracle backpack. I can guarantee you that. Also, the place where they sit in the plane, you know, like the way they behave. It's just like it's it's obvious when you're in this industry right and when you do it every single week i mean you know so many people right like eventually mm -hmm. you draw stereotypes then you know stereotypes are just for fun but you're mm -hmm. often right and when you're in a plane and you're going to a destination and you see other consultants you want to figure out where they're going right because the telco industry is that is the industry where where lots of consultants go it's a wealthy industry so you know that it's likely that they're going to be working in telco or they're either working in telcos or they're working in banks or if you're in the middle east they're working for the government right so it's kind of like certain industries that you know they that then maybe the next day you find them in your client right so you want to figure out who they are so you kind of like peek through and like look what sort of a logo you can find i've heard that what is it the, the first flight of the day from dubai to riyadh on monday morning is like it costs oh. like seven times the price even an economy of every other flight and it's like a, a who's who yeah. of uh, uh, of the business it's every single <laughs> consulting it's like and, and my best friend goes there every week and you know like yeah. I, ne I never worked in saudi but yeah. I, we, my company used to have teams of like 30 people working in Saudi, right? We launched the third operator in Saudi, the third mobile operator. So we have like huge teams going every week. And yes, it's insane. The price and, and you and you walk in and from what I can I can hear from others, it's just like basically everybody's a consultant there. Hmm. So convince me of luxury travel. Um, I, I use points programs, so I stay at sort of luxury. The only, but the only real extreme luxury I, I guess maybe in my concept was to get to the outer seychelles i spent the night for the grand opening of the roche island uh, uh the the four seasons there and uh it was cool for the destination but it's like 10 times what i've ever paid for a hotel room so oh you so what do i have to convince you Hmm? I have to convince you of the value, not not that I have. When you said convince you of luxury travel, I was like, uh, what do I have to convince you of? <laughs> so it's the value, yeah. the value for money. Because I I generally feel 
and as, as I said, I use points. So it'll be if, if I redeem for a luxury hotel, I always feel like I had a a less memorable, less enjoyable uh, experience on my trip. Plus, I'm also looking for the things that go wrong, maybe. So uh, whereas if I just if I just stay at an average place, a family run place, the memories are better. It's it's uh, it's like you, they treat you like the nephew that didn't learn their language. So either you know the the couple that's running the place treats you like family and that. And I I um I just I, I'm always left cold. Uh, the only times we really do luxury hotels is just my wife and I if it's purely a, a romantic getaway. But but even then we pick a place like Hong Kong where we're we're out all day eating and eating and the hotel is is just a backdrop. Well, I love it, right? So for me, it's like uh, um, obviously. I mean, I guess you will find people who will say like, you know, if I can choose, I prefer to stay at a hostel because I like the atmosphere. And a lot of people say that. I never stayed at hostels. When I started traveling, I was already starting to travel for work. So I was already staying at five star hotels. And so I never really backpacked. I don't own a backpack. I never have. Uh, I never stayed at a hostel. So I don't know what the experience is. Everybody, and I, again, I, it's good to have a group with lots of solo people. I always like my own bedroom. I don't, I don't go to the shared bedroom. Yes. So I, 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 I could, oh, oh my God, I could not do that. Definitely. I could not share a room with other people. Like, oh my God, like I, I would wake up in the morning and unless I had a sound night, if anybody was waking me up or, and somebody would wake you up and like, oh my God, like I would be so pissed when I would wake up. <laughs> I'd be like completely like annoyed. There's nothing that annoys me more than people uh, waking me up or like not being able to have a good night's sleep because of other people. And, and yesterday I was woken up by my neighbors and I was so pissed by them that I actually got out of bed and got to tell them off to please turn the, the music off at eight in the morning. Morning, they were blasting like rock music mm. I mean like no that would piss me off completely but I never did it at the time and, and I wish I did I really wish that when I was younger I had the chance to take a year off and go sabbatical when I was in my early 20s you know but I, ne I just never really traveled much when I was that young and later later on I was I already had the money and my company was paying for it so why would I stay at a hostel when I can stay at a five-star hotel right and I like it and now that I'm also in the industry Sometimes it's a collaboration with a hotel. Sometimes I use my points. Uh, I have Amex. When you live in Singapore, you don't have that many credit card points and things like you have in the US. Right here, it's very, very limited. You know, it's just what I spend on my Amex that I turned into points and that's it. So obviously I was very good with points when I was traveling every week. So I would get all the points from my company uh, paying for my trips and then I would use them to travel personally, right? So, I mean, I wasn't paying for it. But I also, like you, I, I am very picky, right? So the mo because it's also my job, the moment I walk into a hotel, I already found 10 things that should be improved. So it's very rare that I walk into a place and I'm like, oh my God, like I'm positively impressed by this place. But it happens. But so there's like a, let's say like a professional hazard of being in, the, in, in this industry, right? Like I like, I enjoy going to hotels. Like I enjoy flying. I really love flying. I love being in airports. I love being in a plane. I love being in business class. I love being uh, in a five-star hotel. I, I, I love it. I love it from a professional point of view. I love it to interact with the GM and meet the GM and the team and understand how they all started, how it all works. I observe all the little details, how the service works, how they lay things, how everything is decorated, how they're cleaning. You know, I, I, I really pay attention and I try to test them to learn more about it. It's likely I will write about it. So I also want to pay attention to this. I also, it's very difficult to impress me, let's say, and, you know, at risk of sounding arrogant, but it's, it's just like, you know, I've seen so many hotels that it's very difficult for me to walk into a place and be like, oh my God, like this place is absolutely amazing. It happens. It happens a lot because, you know, I'm not that difficult to impress, but it's not, most people will walk into a place and be like, oh my God, this is amazing. And I already found 10 things that could be better, you know, just because I can compare. So the value for money for me, it's even harder because I'm like, okay, like this place was $500, but wait, like this is not worth $500. For $500, this place should be way better because look, these other places are much better for $500. So the value for money for me is like a global thing, right? I compare globally and I'm like, this place is not worth it, you know? So I also have like- I wanted to think, because when I do think about luxury, uh, there are certain regions where I feel like I would get value and great experience. And so- like when I talk to people about points programs, I say generally uh, from your expectation, add a star in Asia and subtract a star in Europe in, in the sense of if, if you're redeeming for say a four, a five star hotel in East Asia, Southeast Asia, you're gonna get whatever you think is much more than five. And if you're gonna do it in, in a lot of places, say in Western Europe, you're probably gonna get a star less than, than what you're experiencing combined. Is that? Is that fair? Are there regions where you feel like you get outsized value? Yeah, I, I think, think that are different, but but the value and the experience 
Yeah. No, and I think that there's two things to consider there. One is the service part and the other one is, let's say, the infrastructure part of it. Mm -hmm. From an infrastructure point of view, in Asia, there are a lot of new hotels. So most of the five star hotels are, are, are new. They're like 10, 15 years old. You know, in Europe, a lot of the five star hotels are old. They have been there for a really long time. It's a very different type of hardware. Right. And, you know, like mm -hmm. you don't find these really flashy development in Europe so much. Right. I mean, in Singapore, Pretty much all of Singapore was not existing here when I moved here, right? In 2010 is when, when Marina Bay Sands opened, right? 2010, mm -hmm. that's 10 years ago, right? So there's a lot of things are way newer and there's much more, many more flashy hotels, let's say in Asia, of the flashy type and of the really like from a hardware point of view impressive than you find in Europe. And then there's the service. I think that in Asia, just like from a cultural point of view, the uh, people are much more service oriented. Um, lots of countries have a very strong service industry in Europe, like take the, the main tourist destinations in Europe, right? Spain, Italy, and France. France is the most visited country in the world, right? Spain is like number three or number two, right? Uh, Italy is up there as well, right? These are the, in the top five most visited countries. And the service industries on those countries, I mean, I can talk for my, for my country, right? Like you go to Spain and... <laughs> <laughs> Good luck, yeah, right? You work in the right time. Like, board, and they say there's one ironing board in the hotel. It's in the housekeeping room, and the housekeeping is gone for the weekend. <laughs> it's it's kind of like it, you know, it's funny. It's funny. It's it's a, it's kind of funny. But if you stay at a five star hotel in Barcelona, you will get five star service, right? So, yeah. and I know because I try to stay there again, like uh, work professional hazard, right? So I try to stay there and I try to try the hotels. And if you stay at a five star hotel you're going to get really good service. But the person that's going to be really good at providing you service in Europe is somebody who has made a career out of it. It's mm -hmm. not somebody who is in their 20s and is doing it to make money and who is living somewhere else to earn money for a living. It's somebody who has made it a, their career choice to work as a butler or as a concierge. You know, It's somebody who has done it for many, many years. So depending on what sort of service you like, if that is a service that you will harder, will be much harder for you to find in Asia. In Asia, there are many more hotels. If you go to a really good five-star hotel in Barcelona, you're going to find really good butlers and really good concierge. Mm -hmm. Somebody who has probably done this for 20 years, you know, who will probably do it all their life. So it's a career choice. It's a very different point of view. And they will be able to share with you many more insider um, knowledge and a different type of thing. More of the old, they'll be able to recommend you, you know, that chef that's very well known for this and that. Not the one that you will find online, but the one that's really, truly something. In Asia, everything is much more new. So it's more about staying up to date with the latest, the hippest and the, you know, the most fun and the most like fashionable in the time. Then, you know, that being said, in Asia, you, if you stay at the peninsula, I like staying at peninsulas, right? I like staying at Mandarin Orientals. And there is where you get that sort of service of people who might have done it for a longer time. And it's more of the old world. I think I am an old person. You know, I like traveling to, I think I, I travel more like somebody who's in their 50s and 60s than somebody who's in their 30s. But that's just my personal preference. But I think it's like, maybe these two things explain a little bit of what you're saying. You know, I, I tend to agree with you. Here, things are usually much better. Uh, and in Europe, things are probably a little bit lower than what you would expect in Asia uh, for the same price. Although I'd say Eastern Europe, I'm often way over surprised, like say the Crown Plaza Belgrade. I and mean, it's maybe not luxury in your in your definition, but for Crown Plaza, it's it's uh, over the top. Now, I'm not I'm not the latest. I'm not the hippest. Christine Hall is asking about Bill Bensley properties. I've, yes, I've never I love Bill Bensley. I love Bill Bensley. In fact, it's the last place I've stayed before all this lockdown. I was in Cambodia and I stayed at his two properties, the ones that he actually owns. I love Bill Bensley design. He has designed hundreds of hotels. I stayed at many of them. Uh, for my birthday last year, I stayed at his new property in, in Bali, which is actually a safari theme. So you're staying in tents in the jungle, mm -hmm. like the same tent that comes, you might stay in South Africa or in other parts of Africa. He built that in Bali, only 20 rooms, literally hidden in the jungle is really awesome. And now I just come back from his, the two resorts that he actually owns, which are a very strong CSR and uh, responsibility and sustainability driven resorts. And it's amazing. I really, I mean, I, I think that his designs are amazing, but what he is doing with his own two resorts is unbelievable, right? He created this foundation and with, uh, with a local partner. And so he built the hotel to sustain the foundation. And the foundation trains people in hospitality. It builds schools. It helps in education, in healthcare, and so on. And then he bought a large plot of land in one of the national parks in Cambodia, in one of the most endangered parts in, in Asia. You know, the corridor between the border between Thailand and Cambodia, that's like massively poached elephants are being poached like crazy and mm -hmm. and you know all the wildlife is, is decimated so he bought a huge plot of land in a in a, an auction with the idea of just preserving it like he literally bought the land so that nobody would build in it and then you know he kind of was asked by the government to build some sort of business so he built a 15 tent again luxury tents like safari in the middle of the jungle 
only 15, and that pays for the rangers that do all the anti-poaching uh, uh, with the um, the Wildlife Alliance is paying for that. So I, I think that what he's doing is like unbelievable, and it's really like when you, when you hear him speaking, you can tell that he's really passionate about what he does. I've seen him cry at the presentation, talking about mm. all the poaching and the animals being killed in Cambodia. So it's it's like it's amazing, and on top of that, his designs are are super cool. I really like it, right? Yeah. What what you're so doing yes, is incredibly amazing as well. I have been, it's been an education. We're going to invite you back for the 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 Spanish language episode where where you won't have to speak as slow. You can go at your normal full speed, and uh, we can. Well, then I and I and Roberto can speak really fast and see who can catch it. <laughs> All right. Thank you, and thank you everyone for joining us tonight. It was great to be. Yeah. Thank you for for having me.